kaupai meti mata tata na kute kariki e e taki na reira kei noi tata ruku hia ruku hia ruku hia ki aru te pupu ke ruku hia ki aiki tere ruku hia ki atau ruku hia ki aio aio ngangaru aio ia tangaro aio te hau tapu a tafiri matia aio te manu o te nei pia o te nei tawira e rapa na na hua anu nei ia kui ma ia koroma E rongo whakiri hea ki ronga, ki a tūturu whakamaua, ki a tīna, tīna, haumi e, hui e, tāe ki e. Kia ora tātai, reire toru ngā mihi, ki ngā mate hua hua, o te wā nei, he ngā mate ara ko June Jackson, ko Moana Jackson, ko Ira Gardner, ko taku tui nei hoki. Oki oki ai roto i te ringa kaha o tō tātou nei kaianga. Nā reira i ngā mate, moi mai, moi mai rā. Koe anō o rātou ki a rātou, tātou e ore ore tanu ana, tēnā tātou. Ka aro anō a hau ki a rātou e noho tūroro ana, a tāre te wā, ko hoki ora ai rātou ki te kaupapa. E heka māhuri nō, te mato o te whenua nei, nau mai, para mai ki tēnei kauhau e kia nei ko he waka taurua, navigating dual world views to strengthen the voice of our ocean. E te tī, e te tā, nau mai, whakapiri mai, rarau mai rā. Ko shō nā wa te rea hau. Ko au te kai ruruku i tēnei wā. And I'm joined here as well by our pukenga, who will provide us with some whakaaro on science and mātaranga Māori, working together to support outcomes for hapu iwi and our communities. The mātaranga Māori is increasingly informing science policy and natural resource management approaches in Aotearoa, New Zealand. <coughs> this session today will reflect on what is Mātaranga Māori, and our panel of Sustainable Seas Kairanga Māori will discuss the opportunities and the barriers for the integration of science alongside Mātaranga Māori to support hapu and iwi marine management priorities, and also to strengthen the voice of our ocean. So, what is Māori knowledge? Well, Mataranga Māori is not biocultural knowledge. Mataranga Māori is not traditional ecological knowledge. Mataranga Māori is it's much more than that. It's, it's deeper. It's intertwined with people, their history, the culture, the ecosystems. And while there's some similarities in knowledge, between other indigenous people throughout the world. There's a shared uh, relationship with the natural environment. Knowledge varies on a national and even on a local scale. So indigenous knowledge or mātaranga Māori also continuously grows and changes as ecological pressures influence its development. So it's a misnomer to think that mātaranga Māori is stuck at 1840. It's a misnomer to think that Mataranga Māori is only limited to a traditional perspective of the world. Similar to science, Mataranga Māori does grow and evolve. It's not just the traditional ecological knowledge. Mataranga Māori includes the belief systems, the epistemologies, values, biophysical science, astronomical science, and knowledge both in a traditional and contemporary sense. So as with Western knowledge, in terms of epistemology, Mataranga Māori has both qualitative and quantitative aspects to it. So there's the values aspect to it, like manaakitanga, like kaitiakitanga, but at the same time, there's the maramataka aspect to it which has evolved after generations of close observations of empirical knowledge with respect to how the interactions in our ecosystems occur. So Mataranga Māori can be defined as the knowledge, the comprehension or understanding of everything visible and invisible existing in the universe. So Mataranga Māori, and kaupapa Māori perspectives recognise that people are intimately connected to ecosystems and that the connection is founded on whakapapa or genealogical connections. 
It also recognizes that Tao Tudu, the natural environment, has intrinsic values or mana. That is the value of something in and of itself, respective of the values that are ascribed by humans. So the natural value has the power to provide us with the benefits to live our lives. And at the same time, there is an acknowledgement that in order to look after the environment, their practices like kaitiakitanga, sustainable resource management, are required in order to ensure that there's benefits for current generations, but also that the livelihoods are ensured for future generations. So it's that long-term perspective that is intrinsic within Mātauranga Māori. And this whakaaro provides the lens for a Māori approach to navigate between the dual world views in order to strengthen the voice of our ocean. So next, our panelists will describe how Mātauranga Māori has informed research that has helped hapu and Māori businesses with their decisions for the marine environment. And they'll also describe how science has helped hapu. Um, so first up, Dan will provide an overview of Mātauranga Māori within a research context. And then he'll be followed by Kane, who will speak to the praxis of Mataka, the triangulation between ecology and astronomy to inform hapu and iwi decisions for marine management. And then finally, Ian will talk about some of the examples of how Mataranga Māori and science have worked to support hapu and marine management. So kia ora tata, I'll now hand it over to Dan. Kia ora tata, nga mihi o te atea. Kia koutou katoa, uh, i rungi te, te karanga o te rā nei, i rungi te kaupapa, tino whakahirihira, uh, me ki mihi mihi kia koi, kia shua nga mo te tuwhira te ai. Te kore o i te rangi nei, nō reira. Um, hea ha tēnā mea uh, te mātauranga e pā na, na rangahau. So how, how does mātauranga um, fit and exist and what does it look like in our research system? So I suppose um, in having, having a look at the, uh, the registration sheet, many of you will have, will have uh, encountered mātauranga uh, through the vision mātauranga policy. Um, and, and I want to be clear that I'm, this isn't a vision mātauranga workshop, but that has been a mechanism for many of you to engage with it. Um, and I can imagine your experiences have been varied, but, but ultimately I'm going to talk mainly about from the perspective of, of, of iwi, hapu and hapori Māori around what, what rangahau looks like in, in the mātauranga space. And I'll pick up on an example that, that Sean gave to describe what, what mātauranga is, and that's kaitiakitanga, a term I'm sure many of you will have uh, encountered already. And, and he describes it as, you know, in that principal space. And, and it is, and, you know, for, for, for want of brevity, maybe it can be understood as uh, the principle of trying to achieve intergenerational sustainability from within a worldview of being part of that system, not um, a part from that system. And that's absolutely true. But in upholding those principles of intergenerational sustainability, we actually do things. And those practices, those things we do, are draw from that knowledge that's based on having lived uh, within uh, and being part of that system through generations. So observations of those natural cycles, and, and I know that, that came, we'll talk about some of those in the maramataka, observation of seasonality, of changes through months, of changes through years, of, of anticipating that change uh, will occur and that change is likely to occur, uh, but sometimes we don't know when that change will, will happen. And so our systems for observing and understanding and explaining the world uh, anticipated that change uh, and, and allowed for it to be incorporated into those systems, but based principally upon those keen observations of the taia, of the world around us. And so kaitiakitanga is both the principle of intergenerational sustainability and the practices we undertake to achieve that, drawn from that knowledge of being part of that system, of that keen observation of those systems and how that, that has varied naturally through time um, and that we can anticipate that change and also make decisions to deliver on those things. So when we think about kaitiakitanga, one, one ap, um, application of it is rahui. Uh, we've seen a lot of rahui lately, and I know that's been a focus point of, 
of some of the work in the Sustainable Seas Challenge. And in a Māori framing, I've been led to understand that uh, when, when the, the modi of, of a mussel bed, or the modi of a fishery, the modi of a bay, a place, became impacted um, either through, you know, maybe over harvesting or, or maybe the snapper were, were, in, um, were fertile, you know, they were hapu and things like that. Uh, the, the modi of those things uh, was, was, was impacted either through har over harvesting or when the fish were, were in their elevated sense of tapu. And when things became over harvested, their tapu levels elevated. And so when the fish are pregnant, their, their, their tapu was increased. And so a rahui was placed with the intention of creating the conditions for that tapu to come back down to a normal level of noa, maybe for that muscle bed to restore, maybe for the fish to have um, had their eggs, had their eggs fertilized, and you know that, that, that breeding season had passed. And so we came back down to a sense of, of regular tapu, of acceptable levels of tapu in that noa state. And so the requirement for the rahui was no longer needed. So the rahui would be lifted. Now, the important thing there is that what guided the decision for when a rahui to be lifted was not the needs of the community. It was how the taiao had responded. It was only when the taiao had reached a good level and when its tapu had come back down, the Modi had come back up again, that the rahui would be lifted. So we responded to the, the taiao, not through human demands. And, and I know I'm getting kind of close to time, I think, Sean. So a couple more minutes, Pia. And so I just want to give you an example of, of how, how rangahau can, can weave together a little bit with, with science. And I hope not to steal some of, some of Ian's kōrero and maybe some of Kane's. In working with um, uh, Ngati Fato Rake in Auckland, they expressed to us that they felt the modi of their bay was being impacted by all the boats and all of, and all of the, um, the activities over on the marina. So they asked us to come in and say, can we help them with that? We said, sure. Um, and trying to understand the impacts of modi, we would apply scientific techniques. We would, you know, simple things, sediment samples, testing for trace metals, testing for um, anti-fouling things, um, testing for the kind of things that might come off um, uh, when boats are being maintained over on the marina. And so we just set up a really simple sampling program, go test the sediments, test around where the marina is, test around where the moored boats were um, to see what, what our findings would, would, would discover. And, and sure enough, we discovered that there were elevated levels of, um, of trace of, so those heavy metals, sorry, particularly found in, in anti-fouling and in anodes and things around the boats that were moored in the bay, particularly around those boats counterintuitively that were more well-maintained. But when we thought about it, it was because they kept on getting sanded back and then reapplied. So more of that antifoul. And antifoul is basically poison for, for um, benthic organisms, of course. We're trying to keep those things from, from, from coming onto our boats. And, and we found a lot of it around the boats that were well maintained. What we also found was really good uh, was that there was virtually no um, detectable levels of, of trace metals or heavy metals outside of the marina where they do a lot of that maintenance work. So we, we were able to go back to the community and say, here are our findings. Now, it, it's not for us to tell you um, how they impact the Modi, but you can take the findings and we did a one and, and they said, oh, okay, well, the Modi of the Bay has been impacted by the boats that are moored out there, um, but it's not being impacted by the marina. And so anyone who's been at Auckland most recently, they will know that there's been a bit of a change in Okahu Bay. Uh, there's no more moored boats in that bay. And that's, that's based on the collaboration we have where we drew from their matauranga around understanding. They had seen tohu in the bay, you know, that things didn't appear to be as prolific. The kaimawana species, the tuangi um, and the pipi uh, were, were no, weren't really growing very well. And so they were, they were trying to understand it from a Maori perspective. You know, we used some scientific techniques, but we answered a, a matauranga based question. And so... I think that's perhaps a really good example of how you can, um, of how maturanga is used in a rangaho space, uh, but also that it's not one or the other. Often it's an, an and. We need maturanga and we need science. But sometimes it's about understanding from whose worldview and, and who, um, whose, whose aspirations are we listening to? And sometimes we, we will need science and sometimes 
Um, we need mātauranga. Most times we need those things woven together. Nō reira. Kia ora mai tātou. Harawe, kia ora Dan. I'll now hand it over to Keane. Kanui te mihi ki a tātou i tēnei wai i rau i ka mai te tono tono e nga kaupapa i rau i te whāraki. A huri noi e mihi e nga kai kōrero i te tepu a ka mihi kawana ki a tātou. Kia ora. I'm going to speak, I guess, a little bit of what our work has been in the space of maramataka. Probably give uh, some context on the journey and um, why that's a, a space that's important to us in terms of our, our mahi and, and, and research as it is. Um, but then also look at the applications of that, I guess, in, in a broad sense. <clears throat> um, and then I guess, again, in a micro level, um, when we're using it as a, as a tool to understand our taia. Um, so Marumataka for us um, began as a journey um, roughly about uh, 10 odd years ago um, through a program developing cultural health indicators. And I, I know everyone's quite familiar with these um, and there's been a lot of great work and foundational work in that space as well. Um, we were tasked, I guess, at looking at uh, a suite of indicators for uh, the mōna here in Tauranga um, through various research projects and discussions with the councils, um, which, which we did to a degree. Um, but I guess the, the, the key factor in that space is that um, we felt that the cultural health industry program uh, didn't really accommodate um, the real kaupapa that our, our whānau were communicating on the ground. And I only say this because um, in those instances anyway, um, the cultural health indicators created a discrete number for the council to use or whoever to use in their own spaces, um, which kind of defeated the purpose of, of what we were doing, which was to have our whānau communicate their kaupapa um, by themselves. Um, so what it did by default, I guess, is instinctively uh, watered down the mātauranga that those whānaus had and how they would communicate it. Um, and that made us think about what we were doing, I guess, as a, as a research entity, uh, but more importantly, um, change our focus on what's more important in that space. And so from taking the space to a, 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 a paradigm, if you want, um, or if you'd like to answer questions for the council, we wanted to change that paradigm and, and, and figure out what questions are more pressing for our whānau. Um, and that's kind of where maramataka led into. Uh, we know that maramataka is a portal, if you like, uh, to see the same things that our tūpuna saw, uh, but only in our, in our specific time. And so a lot of our attention went to understanding uh, what maramataka meant um, in terms of its, its own space and time. Uh, through its own Atua domains, um, look at what tupuna wisdom was held within those spaces, um, both here in the Mona and abroad, um, and also with our Tua Kana whānau uh, across uh, the Pacific, um, to understand how we enable ourselves um, as tangata uh, to use these epistemologies in these spaces of our Atua domains or our Taio domains. And so that's that's really what our, our attention has been focused on. Um, naturally, um, that progressed a, a lot of discussion. I'm just showing these shell tuners on this thing are quite distracting. But um, in any case, Maramataka was a portal for that to start those discussions. And we're just fortunate within in Aotearoa oh, and abroad across the Pacific that there's a lot of advocates, I guess, on discussing uh, the importance of maramataka. What we were keen to do, though, was put that uh, into, into some form of practice. Um, and so to put it into practice, we first have to understand uh, what its origins are, uh, looking back at the epistemologies of our tūpuna, and then going to practice those understandings uh, in our taiao itself, uh, and 
during that process, you get a, a clear understanding of what our tile domains are or our Aotearoa domains, um, but more importantly, how significant they are and um, communicating the cycles, as, as Dan put it in his previous discussion, uh, of our tile. And so that was really important for us that unearthed, I guess, um, lots of questions, um, but also guided us on, on what our directions, you know, direction was, how do we implement this in our given day uh, as tangata. Um, so on a, on a broad sense, um, the key indicators or, or discussion tools that we had, uh, we're looking at our Atua domains. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, what are the energy transfers that they give to give Modi to something else? Um, and the epistemologies um, that explain that. Um, so that's naturally a, a, a diverse range of looking through our traditional uh, storage of knowledge. Uh, whether it be Fokairo, Motiatia, Patere, Waiata, uh, and the like. Um, but more importantly, our karakia, which was uh, instinctively a, a portal to give indication of how you would operate in those spaces. And so those, that's been, I guess, a, a clear foundation for our research. On a micro level, I guess, when we look at um, the application of Maramataka, uh, I'll, I'll use the kōkota, um, or the pipi, if he's Australis, that are here in the picture, uh, I guess, as an example. Um, one of the key things that we learn is that everything has a koa and a tipa, um, and then it's a tangata practice in those spaces. And so for us, um, we know that um, our tayo has a koa, uh, where there's constant things, and, and our moon or marama is a, a testament to that. Um, the same faces of the moon are the same faces that our tupuna have seen, um, way ra and more. And so what we aim to do there is really get an understanding of what that actually means. Um, and so those constants, if you want to call them that, are, are pretty clear. Um, but it's more in reaction of the tikung of the tail that react to those spaces in time. And so what we're generating there is, I guess, an ind indigenous timestamp or an indigenous way of telling time. Um, we know these constants are happening um, without fail, um, whether it be the marama, the sun, um, and the various other things that happen through our tail. Um, but more importantly, we know our tail and the, and the things that live in that space um, react to those things as well. Um, it was really cool hearing Dan's corridor around Kaitsaki and for, for us here in uh, Tauranga Mona, our kōkota is a kaitaki. Um, in many ways, it's kawa is to reproduce uh, in, in many aspects, but it's tikanga is to really um, uphold uh, the fundamentals of what's happening in those estuaries, whether it be stability of banks, um, providing microhabitats for fish or other animals, um, filtering, uh, the, the ocean or the sea and its capacity. Um, and then again, selflessly giving sustenance to the people around it. So uh, really gives you an idea on what a, um, a koitiaki is. Um, but more importantly, our maramataka was able to generate the discussion around um, what are these cycles of our kokota. And so on a micro level, uh, we start to rethink a way of how we look at our tayo. Um, in terms of cycles on a micro level, i.e. the cycle of our kōkota, um, and then again, how those cycles fit within the time stamps that our tūpuna viewed as well. Uh, yeah, kia ora. Kia ora, Kane. Thanks for that. So, mātaranga pākehi. Within Sustainable Seas, we've got um, the Blue Economy theme, and there's a couple of projects that are looking at um, indigenizing the blue economy in Aotearoa. So that's been led by John Reed and Jason Mika. And then there's another uh, project which is looking at um, exploring fisheries tikanga and mataranga, along with another project uh, which is looking at kia whakika te moana. So 
the context for these types of projects is that Mātauranga Māori and Māori perspectives are often relegated to the cultural context or whatever the broader issue that uh, that sometimes our researchers are exploring. And oftentimes we tend to forget that Māori do have interests that are economic ones as well. And it's a tricky space to navigate because from a Mātauranga Māori perspective, there was always the sense of trying to achieve a balance between people and those ecosystems. So that there was that ethic of kaitiakitanga uh, that ensured, to ensure that there was that lasting legacy for future generations. And those were some of the drivers that informed the way that we benefited from the natural environment or received in an economic sense utility. But now, Within a modern context, uh, the focus is more on extraction, on exploitation, on profit maximization. And so it's within that context that Māori businesses are often um, operating within. At the same time, I think some of our Māori businesses, whether it's one in New Zealand, the Iwi Collective Partnership, and other more um, tribal-based fisheries organizations, companies, they're wanting to explore and be more aligned or culturally attuned to the needs of their beneficiaries. And if the iwi members are saying you need to be a good kaitiaki as well as being a good um, uh, business person, then I think that provides um, an interesting space for our Māori businesses to operate in. And they are striving to achieve a balance between the commercial needs or the commercial drivers. And often at times they are not necessarily going to be in balance, but are in direct conflict with what the, the shareholders or the beneficiaries are promoting them to do. So if we've got the whakaro from Dan and from Kane talking about ensuring that there is that kaitiakitanga, that lasting legacy, the challenges for a lot of our Māori businesses is how to make a really good go of ensuring that there is that intergenerational equity, that there are fish available for future generations, but at the same time, trying to meet some of those more direct or immediate commercial needs. And some of the systemic changes have really have to occur within the industry in order for the Whakaro Māori or for a Mātauranga Māori perspective to really be sustainable or flourish. Because if you've got a number of people who are just participating in the fishing industry that are primarily in there for the short-term benefit, then that places a lot of stress on the, or pressure from on those Māori businesses in order to perform to what the industry standards are. However, if the industry was to transition to something that's more sustainable, they took more of a long-term perspective. And I think a number of our Māori businesses are taking the lead in terms of the types of fishing activities that they engage in, the types of equipment that they're utilising. So equipment that minimises the impact on the natural environment, that actually encourages the, the fisheries to flourish. I mean, those uh, activities that are more investment intensive, or it requires a bit more money, and your competitors are less likely to engage in that. But in the long run, I think these businesses are going to be, Māori businesses are going to be well placed in terms of ethically supporting the, the direction that has been given by Hapu and Iwi, and then also potentially financially when there's going to be increasingly requirements from nation states or governments in order to move or transition industry towards more of a sustainable type of approach. So kapai, I'll, I'll leave that there. So yeah, the point is that um, the ethical positions from a Whakaro Māori perspective, like um, whakapapa, kaitiakitanga, manakitanga, are incredibly important in order to drive the directions of how the activities are carried out within a Māori fishing business. Uh, next, I'll hand it over to, to Ian for his whakaaro and mātauranga a hapu. Kia ora, Sean. Um, 
Mano a mai te mauri nuku, mano a mai te mauri rangi, ko te mauri kia hau he mauri titua. Ka pakaru mai te pō, tau mai te mauri, haumi e hui e taiki. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, yeah, very fortunate to be able to follow on from uh, Dan and Kane and awesome intro from um, Sean. Uh, yeah, so um, the opportunity just to share some what I'm learning as being part of the Hua Tokina um, T2 project. And those are the two, our two main sites up the coast here, Whareponga and Waipiro Bay. People ask what's my role, because so I think I'm more sort of freshwater eel orientated. So I've got the prop, tea towel. I'm more like a ringa wera of the, a part of this crew. Um, so we have uh, Pia Pohatu, Riri Piki Riri, and SJ Heaney, who are sort of focusing on the policies and frameworks, because we have the um, Ngātipurau uh, 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 Rohe Moana Act. So we've got the Act that sort of gives us um, sort of the structure, and this is this project feeds into that as part of actually giving imp implementation, giving effect to those um, to the Act itself. Um, so they're sort of looking at the policy uh, policy parts, and um, Justin Tibble is leading the uh, marine based part. So. Um, and the first thing that sort of uh, captured my sort of interest was um, they've got too many kina in Waipiro Bay. So I said to the bro, I said, oh, gee, I'll come up there with um, marijuana and some butter and, and we'll get stuck into culling some out. And um, yeah, yeah, so that was that was sort of the, the, the lighter side of it. Um, but they do have too many kina. So part of the project is to look at ways of um, addressing that. So uh, the team moved, you know, thousands of kina last year from high density area to low density area. Um, and now we're going back and have a look to see uh, the effects of that mitigation on the high density and the, and the sort of place around Kapitakai areas. So um, this sort of ties back to that dual um, using Western science and my tauranga. And uh, Justin Tibble is a classic example, I reckon. Um, he was doing this mahi way before uh, the project came along. Um, because Kaitaki is off, off by Pearl Bay and Whareponga. So he's been doing this for ages. And um, so he is Aringa Ropa. Um, but he's gone away and uh, part of this project, he's also um, getting his dive certificates. Uh, so he's a qualified scientific diver as well. So there's that dual, those two wheels again. So we'll come out at the end of this project, be able to walk in both wheels, be able to do the scientific surveys, teach the whanau how to do that, but as well as um, well, yeah, being informed with my tauranga as a kaitiaki. So um, that's sort of the long-term sort of thing we're seeing from the project. Once the project finishes, how can we um, build the cap capability and capacity of the whanau up there so that they can carry on the mahi that's been for the project, during the project, and then and carrying on? What can we learn? How can we restore the balance of the population, the modi of um, bays, whareponga uh, and waipiro, and then ultimately how can what we learn from this project, can, how can we, what lessons can we learn and share with our hapu north and south, um, well, around the country really. So it's all about that sharing. So that's what we sort of um, really love hearing Kōrero from uh, you know, Dan and Kane and everyone and Sean and everyone about what we're doing in our own sort of areas and, and can we share some of that knowledge or what it worked, you know, say reinventing wheels, all that sort of things. So those are sort of the dual thing. Um, another point we have, and, and, and um, Sean, you just talked about it as far as commercial goals. Um, and that, yeah, this sort of has been sort of quite a big, big question and debate since um, the Fisheries Act, the Māori Fisheries Act. Um, so it's commercial versus customary it doesn't have to be versus you know I, I sort of yeah reminded of when Dan was talking about my tauranga and western science sometimes it can be the end ideally it is the end rather than the all so um that's another uh, sort of facet to this project is um Ngātipuro seafoods is kinakota uh, Waipiro Bay might have too many kina can there be some sort of um relationship or idea where you know we can balance those things out so um yeah you just sort of test that system if, if, if we have surplus can you actually you know, make sure there's enough for for customary purposes but also uh, you know is, is there enough for long-term um commercial goals because 
as Māori, we all have uh, have those hats and um, as far as customary and commercial and recreational go. So it sort of adds, adds to the um, the richness of, of what we're learning and um, of the project. Uh, what else? Uh, so yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. The, so we're working. Um, the, another thing that we've sort of had we've learned along the way, and I think it's probably goes throughout all the projects, is that the whole thing was COVID and uh, the ability for us to wānanga uh, face to face, kanohi kite kanohi. So that's been a, a, a big issue. How can we work work around that? You know, go to these sorts of zoom zoom things, but ideally it is face to face. It is on the marae because that's when you get the richness and you get the um, uncles and aunties that are, you know, can share share what they have, because a lot of this is, is place-based and um, you yeah, just can't, can't be being in situ or be, being in there, you know, at the back with the, with the uh, tea towel and helping out. Um, learn so much on those, um, yeah, extra, extra parts. But um, yeah, uh, it's just one of those things we, we're having to sort of, um, we're all having to uh, readjust to, be resilient to. Um, yeah, so the communities with the marae up in uh, Whareponga Waipera Bay have been amazing. And yeah, so uh, our project, we're just aiming to, um, be able to help the kaitiaki, um, yeah, just give them some extra tools. Um, at the same time, learning from, you know, the, the, the words, wisdom of our elders, um, a lot of richness, a lot of, a lot of solutions already there. We've just got to um, be open to listening, to learning and um, making sure that the voice of um, our hapu comes through. And uh, yeah, we're sort of there just to facilitate or could be a catalyst to help, you know, um, yeah, give, give volume to those voices. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, welcome um, to any questions that sort of follow on from the discussion. Kia ora. Hapai, kia ora, Ian. Well, we'll now go into the Q&A session. That's uh, from our presentations. Um, so probably the first question for um, our panellists, and I'm going to put it to you, um, Ian, and that's around what have been the, you talked about some of the opportunities of potentially leveraging off the, the economic opportunity of fishing the, the kina in the area with nuts nice below seafoods. Just wondering if there was any uh, challenges or barriers that you see you know, through your mahi with respect to bringing together the science and Mātauranga Māori to help even up in the decision making process. Okay, yeah, well, well, good science. Uh, well, um, accurate understanding of what's going on is essential for any fishery. Um, and I think that can be something that we can, we can, uh, it's a bit of understanding how those two worlds work. So I sort of have a background in, in the commercial side of things as well. So definitely here the, you know, it's the commercial taking too much and extracting too much. But then sometimes if you look at it up the hill, up the, up the catchment, that you see all the, um, all the runoff and putty coming down. Um, there's other effects that are not just human extractive uh, sort of effect, not just commercial fishing. So it's about awareness, understanding. And a lot of this is actually can be sorted from, from my experiences from a humble cup of tea and a biscuit. She's sitting around and just talking and listening and, Letting people sort of, oh, um, but yeah, amazing what just a cup of tea and a biscuit. So, oh, that was, oh, I didn't realize that, or you know, or, oh, okay, but well, that's, that's a cool thing to understand. So, if we can work it through, um, you're having patience to, to understand all the sides of the, of the mix. And I think good science and my tone huge into un, it'd be a huge um, solution or part of the solution to unlocking those so that we do find that nice harmony. Yeah, for sure. Got it, So, Dan, you talked about the Okahu Bay experience. Can you tell us a bit more about um, how that process was carried out? Like, how did the uh, Ngāti to become part of the process to start informing those decisions around the, um, around the bay? Yeah, kia ora. So, uh, the Okahu Bay uh, domain came back as part of Ngāti Whātua's settlement, so they were into a co-management uh, arrangement there. And so, um, of course, they've been looking holistically at Takapara Whāua or Kahu Bay at Podio over the back, and of course, you know, naturally transitioning into, into Kahu Bay there. Um, they'd, they'd undertaken a process of 
of looking at a, a re restoration plan for for the the bay, the domain, and, and the surrounding areas. And and the key component that drove that was was Modi, and they had a they had a vision statement. And I'm gosh, I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but it talks about um, that they they knew that the, the Modi of the bay was back um, when when they had Ngati Fatua presence in and on the bay as users uh, gathering Kaimoana. Um, and so that was kind of, that was the tohu. Once, once all of that was happening, they knew that the Māori would have been restored. And so there's lots of things that have to happen there. They have to separate the stormwater from the wastewater. They have to ensure that the kaimoana um, are there. They have to ensure that the kaimoana are there in, in populations that can sustain harvesting. They have to ensure that the kaimoana are there and are not toxic to eat because sometimes the paru flows into the ocean. And so we could break down this vision this, that was really, really captured well in terms of restoring the Modi um, and then and all these little little kind of pieces. And so looking at uh, impacts to Modi was, was part of the, the corridor that we were having there. And, you know, the, in the Kaumatawas, we just say, no, we've seen this, that, that the Kaumawana aren't really coming back. Uh, maybe, maybe there's stuff coming from the boats. And so we just went and checked that out and sure enough. But, but the process of, of that, um, we, as is, as is part of our tikanga, we, at the end of the, um, you know, doing research, we report it back to whomever we're working with. And of course, the information belongs to them. Um, and we ask for permission for us to kind of use it and maybe publish it. And, you know, that's kind of what we do in this space. They took that information, used it as part of their submission on the unitary plan and said, we want boats removed, um, impacting the Modi, here's the evidence. I understand there were quite a few applications by different groups, including mana whenua groups around Tamaki when the unitary plan came up. But as best I understand, there was only one granted, and that was to Ngati Whātua Rake. And it's because they had the information, but they, the information fitted their tunnel, it fitted their perspective. And so um, that you, you can't argue with it. When the, when the evidence is in front of you, um, you know, the, the right decision was made. And so that those boats have been removed. So it was a really nice combination of, of the Mataranga Rangahau, the, the research, um, the rigour that the research brought uh, within that lens of the Ngati Whātuarake lens, and then using through those processes to get an outcome that was beneficial. So there was a real good triangulation between science and Mataranga Māori in order to help achieve that outcome. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we could, we, we probably couldn't have achieved the outcome without using the tools of science, but we were, we were drawn there using the understandings of Mātauranga. Cool. Well, for our participants, if you want to ask us a question, just put it into the chat, please, and we'll try and get around to answering it. If not, during this webinar, we'll endeavour to answer it post the webinar as well. So just a follow up for you, Kane. Just a um, part around, um, are you able to talk a bit more about how there was the alignment between some of the technical uh, science observation skills that you guys were exploring, uh, e.g. the sampling and so on, and how that helped support some of the kind of the development of the marabataka that you guys have been exploring? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, <clears throat> I guess our MO um, coming out of the, the CHI space and the environmental monitoring space um, was a conflict of our own values. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, our tikanga and kawa led that space. And, and just, just as um, Dan had mentioned, um, that's that's what we had always aimed for. Um, we see science as tools to um, create some more communication of that process of inquiry. And so um, for us um, in our current project um, that have, I guess, three case study groups across the Te Hiku o Te Hika, um, there, well, our primary goal in that is to really understand everything that we want to know from our, our tūpuna kōrero perspective. Um, and that's important because it builds the foundation of what you're aiming to achieve in terms of those tile spaces. 
And then we look at other sets of tools, uh, whether it be uh, tools that are tūpuna used, um, or as well as the current tools that are around today to help um, one, uh, create uh, assessments to measure ourselves on what we're hoping to achieve, but two, to also communicate to um, the spaces that our, our case study groups uh, have their networks in, i.e. the councils, into iwi um, and the like. So um, for us, um, that's been refreshing um, because uh, our tūpunas kōrero um, leads the, the modus operandi in that space. And I think that's really important. It's important to us. Um, but more importantly, for the whānaus that um, are in those spaces, they truly believe that their kōa and tikanga of their tūpuna and their understanding of the entire spaces um, is going to create solutions. Um, so, um, yeah, that's all I can share in there. Kia ora, Kanga. Thanks for that. You raise a really good, important point that the process of empiricism was not solely the domain of Western science, and that our tipuna had their own approaches, had their own methods in terms of the observations of. Um, monitoring the state and the impacts on our tayao. Dan, I was wondering if you had any further thing to add to that and, and Ian? Yeah, I'll just share a, a few thoughts. Absolutely, Totoko, that uh, our uh, Matauranga contains much knowledge that you can show the accuracy and you can show the precision because it's been rigorously generated. Um, you know, the, the mere fact that it was developed um, and, and built up independent of science is kind of a moot point. It's almost not even relevant because science is, is, is a method. Um, and it's the key, the key part of the method. And our people were producing um, spectacularly reliable and precise and accurate information. How else did they people the Pacific? How else did they keep finding these little pinpoints as, as one example? Uh, and so that's, that's one of the exciting things um, for me and maybe one of the things when I quote it on these kind of fora where people get the most amazement, they say, oh, actually, it's not just because we codify the knowledge in different ways doesn't mean it's any less precise, rigorous or, or accurate. Mm -hmm. Kia ora. Follow up, Ian? Yeah, oh, excellent. Yeah, um, I just reminded of um, a story about uh, my father and his brother, and there were five, five and seven year old olds at Waitui there. Um, their job was to go and get tuna from uh, Lake Ripangaiti. So it was all about sustenance, it was actually survival. If you didn't catch a kai, the whanau was starved. So, um, yeah, so it had to be very precise and very accurate. Otherwise, you lost your job. Um, yeah, so th th these two would go up there, the story goes, and they'd, they'd they get their you know, whole lot of tuna, uh, drag them back down the hill, and on way through the village, uh, they stop off and they'd be dropping off tuna to the old old people or people that were sick. So by the time they got home to the to the, the, the homestead, um, some of them they get there was nothing left, and they get a big growling, you know, because you know, whānau didn't have it, so they get sent to go back up and do another trip around. So um, yeah, so I find it quite quite amusing, but a lot of um, a lot of morals about the kaitiakitanga, looking after your whānau, um, putting others first, but making sure there's enough to go around. I think they've got sustainability now, but those sorts of uh, quite cool stories, yeah, sort of um, draw a lot from that mātauranga that draws into actually knowing where and when to get what, how much was enough, all those sorts of really yeah, cool lessons, aren't they? Well done. Just got a comment from Edna Lahiron, and Edna says that uh, she's enjoying the kōrero and hearing the unpacking of mātauranga and associated concepts. So yeah, kia ora for that, Edna. Now, just another part, and it's really around the, um, the validity of mātauranga Māori. So, been in the news a bit. Royal Society has been under fire from another number of their members with respect to the validity of mātauranga Māori. And um, there's probably also no doubt going to be challenges to the, the type of mahi that we do. A lot of people would dismiss it as just hearsay, it's just fairy tales and the like. 
So question for the panelists is, within a co-governance type of context, how do we ensure that mātauranga Māori is still an important part of the, the processes where we're looking after the, the moana? Um, who would like to start off first? I can probably provide a, an example and then I'll throw it over to Dan. So just quickly in terms of some of the mahi that we did for Taitimi Taipari, the Hauraki Marine Spatial Plan, it was a project that went for a number of years and involved a number of agencies from local government, Hapu and Iwi, and some of the um, businesses in the area. And it was a, a collaborative approach and it did take a lot of time and a lot of resource to come to a space where people as a group were happy with where the, the direction of the plan was headed. And important parts of the plan was, um, was power sharing and then also acknowledging that Mataranga Māori had a role to play in terms of the monitoring of some of the outcomes. So I think that's probably for me, one of the important things to come out of our mahi rangaho is ensuring that when we have a strategic aim, which might be about whakahoki te mauri o te moana, returning the well-being or the life force back to the moana, that we not only have um, some ecological indicators, but we also have mātauranga Māori indicators to help triangulate and provide more of a holistic picture. Also importantly, alongside that, there needs to be economic and social indicators as well. Dan Hifakaroa, you've got some, some thoughts? Yeah, that, that's... Um... On the one hand, I'd be kind of flippant and say, I don't really want to give any more oxygen um, to that argument. Uh, it, it, everyone <laughs> that I know who, who follows the scientific principles um, will be found wanting if they refuse to see the validity of mātauranga Māori. So um, on, on the one hand, I don't want to be flippant because I know they're there, but if you actually follow the own, the own rules you say you're upholding, um, you, you, you would be found wanting by saying mātauranga Māori is, is not valid. So, but on the other, on a more constructive way, um, I think the really key fundamental thing to start on is, is acknowledging that everyone has a worldview. Um, and because there's been one dominant worldview, it became almost invisible. Um, and, and the importance of doing that is to recognise that our, our worldview exerts quite a significant control over what we do um, and how we act and behave both consciously and subconsciously. We're seeing it in more recent times with um, unconscious bias, say with respect to, you know, you know, CVs coming in, whether it's a hewahini, hetani pia. And so, you know, our brains work in these ways. And so acknowledging that we have worldviews and then accepting that there might be some different ones it has been a fundamental first step in, in workshops and, and, and things I've done with, with my science colleagues who said that's been a really revelatory moment for them. That, um, and then to be clear, we're not asking everyone to say, you've got to believe in Rangi and Papa and stuff. You're saying, you need to believe that some people believe that. And therefore, their start point on this thing we're talking about is different to yours, but it's just as valid. And so then that opens up the ability for new realities for these things to work together. Um, and then once that's done, um, and, and, you know, most people who, who just want to use, you know, pretty straightforward logic and irrational thinking, you can actually have some really formative and generative discussions. So one of those ones I've been privileged to and being involved with is with the Environmental Protection Authority, Te Manarohi Taiao, where we recognised that uh, Mataranga was being provided in, in, in processes that we ran, um, but it wasn't really being heard, it wasn't being understood. Uh, and so we needed a different mechanism. If we just use the scientific lens to explain a tanifa pia, you would dismiss it outright. But if you used a matauranga framing to say, oh, kuru mai pāna tērā, now does it, does it manifest in different ways? Does it have one home? Is it there all the time, you know? What are some of the tikanga around that particular um, tanifa? You can then probe into and determine the veracity and get right into those observations that that tanifa was designed to make people aware of that this might be a perilous place to put a house, a town, a bridge, that there might be a um, massive tsunami which may have come through there. And once you start using that, um, have that acceptance at the governance level and then having those kind of frameworks. So we've developed a mātauranga framework for determining the veracity of mātauranga as evidence. So we need to use a mātauranga framework to determine what, 
what that evidence is because we needs to be strong enough to be able to say, oh no, you are just making up a tiny fire there, but no, this one, you know, this one has real substance and papa papa. And so I think that that's a response I'd have there to 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 part of it, which is um, for for those who genuinely, you know, are, are unwilling. I think they're not playing by their own rules by which they look they're up into uphold. And for those that are willing, well, the world is a whole new um, realities exist for them. Order. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, I got a question from Phil Ross, and Phil asks: um, With recent environment court cases about marine species and biodiversity management have been pitted against, um, you know, iwi versus hapu, fisheries, property rights versus Modi and sustenance. So there raises a lot of issues around complexity. And, it, and uh, Phil asks: you know, What are some obvious uh, way forwards, or not so obvious way forwards? One of Kane, if you could talk to your guys' recent experiences around um, Tauranga Moana and how there were some challenges around um, potential contested property rights and how you guys are resolving or moving towards resolving that. Sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, <laughs> do, do you have a whakaro on that? Yeah, that, that is a bit of a hospital pass, my mate. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've only been... Uh, involved in, in those spaces as, as a, a, I guess, a minority level. Um, but it goes back to that question of co, even if that's the right word as well, or partnership. Right. Uh, I mean, what's the real meaning of that? Um, we know that uh, uh, koa and tikanga uh, can be uh, place-based. Um, and if we keep that in mind, a lot of the place-based call and tikanga uh, varies. And I know uh, firsthand in our mona, a koa at one end of the mona is different to the other end. So uh, we have to acknowledge how we um, create a space to have discussions with those things in mind. Um, and I think that's the real key to any partnership, um, mm. be able to disagree and agree, um, but people's koa and tikanga doesn't get watered down. And I think in any space where we're using a, a political background or a policy background or even a background that stems out of uh, the courts, uh, by default, coal and tikanga is going to get watered down anyway. And so there's no winners in that, in, that, in the space of coal and tikanga, um, other than then that there's been a lot of angst. <laughs> Uh, on how those spaces are created. So um, it's probably more of a comment than any solution to, to Phil's question. I'm looking at Phil now through and through the window. And <laughs> I don't have an answer, mate. <laughs> <laughs> got by. Uh, we got, uh, one more question. We'll finish off one more question from Matua Joe. So Matua Joe asks, uh, rangatahi programs are coming to the fore. Touch the minds and the hearts of rangatahi by getting them into the moana, to feel, to hear. To know the O of the Moana. Can you talk about any rangatahi programs that you uh, are aware of? I might throw this over to both Ian and um, Dan. Dan, you want to just quickly start us off? Yeah, and this might be a little bit wider than, than what Joe was talking about, but oh, through yeah. my role at UNESCO, um, we're trying to connect up all the, the Polynesian youth. Um, and I absolutely agree, you know, that we haven't had them around the decision-making table um, for a while now has, has been a travesty um, because they aren't shackled by some of the things that come with adulthood and, and some of those that thinking. And so uh, internationally uh, on the UNESCO network, we're trying to bring together. So for example, we want to bring down some of the, the youth Pacific um, leaders for the Marine Sciences Conference, which is going to be later in the year in November. So that's, that's one rangatahi um, thing. And I also understand particularly around the waka, Mokahodua and those navigators. So, yeah. Kia ora. Over to you, Ian. I'll just put yeah, quick two cents with them on that. Um, yeah, so uh, part of our project is to bring the rangatahi through. So Joe Burke and Kura have taken through a group of rangatahi, do free diving. So we've talked about the scientific divers and the mahi they're doing. They were ably assisted by um, a group of free divers as well. So they're learning learning as they go, and that's part of that, what happens after the project, thinking 
the rangatai and rangatai of today, rangatai of tomorrow. So about bringing mm. them through and yeah, just getting them buzzing over. Yeah, my science and yeah, yeah, and for another one of our Tangaro projects, Afi Mai Afi Atu, enacting a Kaitiaki Tanga based approach to EBM, led by Kura Paul Burke. There's a lot of rangatahi that have been brought into that uh, mahi as well, as well as your guys' programs as well, eh, Kane? Yeah, yeah. And. Mm. Hi, Tony, bro. No, no, I was just, um, we're always advocates for rangatahi and um, our space, we're a charitable trust and that's where a lot of our charity uh, investment goes to, um, applying a te ao Māori lens um, with our rangatahi and tamariki um, because we're mindful of that um, they're going to be dealing with a lot more problems than what we're dealing with today. And it's actually quite rewarding on how much you learn from our rangatahi and tamariki on how they view the world. As, as we said, uh, uncompromised in some respects to uh, Pākeke Taka, but um, yeah. Kia ora. Yeah. We've got a super complicated question as well from Nick Lewis, but I think we'll have to catch up with him uh, sometime later. <laughs> <laughs> have, a, have another quarter with him. Talk further about it. Uh, we are Homa. Tāhuanaukua Zina, Homi, Huye, Taiki, Mighty Ore Homa, Kapaitra. Kyora, Hora, Matiwa, Kakite, Kakite.